tonight we're going to have a kind of a Q&A, and it's kind of more focused about Halloween and different things. So if you guys have any questions, don't be afraid. David's going to have the microphone, and so you guys can just raise your hand, and then he'll bring it to you, and then you can ask Stephen a question. And uh, I'm going to pass it to Mariah for announcements before we get started. Um, I don't know if we have a lot of announcements, but also his video on Sunday, if you guys weren't here on Sunday, that's on YouTube, so you can just go to Calvary or Valley on YouTube and subscribe, and then we also did a podcast with him today, so that will be released, I think, next Tuesday, so stay tuned for that, and also when we do the questions and you raise your hand, um, we're going to keep it just under a minute, so just letting you know, David will give you a little nudge or something. Um, and then also, we're going to try to keep it all related to Halloween. And you can also ask questions about occult objects or stuff like that. But I'll also ask questions or the questions that are on YouTube Live. So I'll say some of them and also direct the conversation in other ways too. We are also ending at 8.30, so just be aware of that. And at 8.30, if you guys have children... Go pick them up. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, um, do you want to start? I talk too much. You have to put it on. I talk too much. No. Oh, also, so the whole point of this, too, is if you guys didn't realize, we do not celebrate Halloween. So, this isn't about... <laughs> So this is not about why we love Halloween, why it's awesome. This is why we do not celebrate Halloween. And also this Saturday, we're having a Halloween alternative. So it's a harvest festival, so you can bring the kids. We're going to have candy. There's no costumes. There's also food that you can order online at CalvaryOV slash Harvest Fest. Or bring your own food. And we'll have obstacle courses and games for the kids, fire. And then we'll have s'mores in the main point of the night is to have prayer and worship but also really pray and intercede for the children's lives and everything and all the darkness that's going on so oh also for the election we'll be praying for the election coming up because that is important so so without further ado there's Stephen Bancars who is not was an ex new ager yeah Stephen do you got anything you want to say before we start Uh, yeah uh, so we're keeping it dressed to Halloween? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and I call it. So I'm not, like, I've done a little bit of research into Halloween. Um, I actually tried celebrating Halloween right after I got saved. This was, like, a month. It would have been, like, a month and a week after I got saved. And I didn't know what I knew about it, like, now. But, um, yeah, I was I was split on it. And I was like, God, should I be, you know decorating the outside of my property with like dead people and <laughs> and I, I was uh, I was kind of sp- I felt like God was saying no immediately and I had like this wolf mask that I had outside but you know someone in my life at the time was like no we have to celebrate it and I was you know it, anyway the point is I it was traumatizing for me as a new Christian to see someone come up to my door and there was like limbs and stuff like on the front front of my door to look like body parts that had been dismembered and this little girl she was four years old and she was so sweet and she was so confused she's like daddy where's the rest of his body and I'm thinking like what am I doing this is garbage (laughs) and um, and then I remember I went to church the next morning I mean I was saved like 10 minutes I didn't know what I was doing right so I, I went to church the next morning and um, I lived in Brantford at the time, and my parents lived in Cambridge. They were driving up from Cambridge to meet us at the church and then come to our house after. And I remember dry, speeding a million miles an hour to get home back to my house where they were coming because I wanted to beat them there so I could take down all the Halloween take decorations. Take the body parts. Yeah. <laughs> so I could hide all the dead things that were out of some house. And it was, it's like, it was just such a glorification of death. That's all I knew about it at that time. It was a glorification of death and darkness. And I mean... I just don't see what fellowship light has with darkness, you know? Um, But when we're talking about Halloween, we're talking about um, something that started in the Celtic condition called Samhain. It's spelled uh, uh, S-A-H-W-E-I-N. And what they would do is there is this belief that um, in the transition of seasons from fall to winter, there would be a thinning of the veil between the natural world and the spirit world. And the belief was that uh, spirits would come up from the underworld 
some from deceased ancestors, some were good and, you know, or at least mild, and some were evil. And the idea was that you would put fruit outside of your house to invite the spirits into your house, and you would set up candles and plates for the spirits to come in and eat and partake. But then you would have, you know, evil spirits that would come as well during this night. And so they wanted to disguise themselves from the evil spirits by trying to dress up to look like them. So that is where the idea of dressing up for Halloween comes from, and in particular, scary costumes, because they wanted to look as scary as they possibly could to try and blend in with the evil spirits that would like roam the earth mm -hmm. that night. So that's where that tradition began. And as for the um, trick-or-treating aspect, there's at least three different uh, opinions I've heard on the origin of that. One being that when people would dress up as these evil spirits to disguise themselves from them, they would go around and sing songs and recite poetry in exchange for food or money. That's one of the origins. Another of the alleged origins was that in the uh, 19th century, some of these kids started vandalizing things on the night of Halloween. And so they would start going to people's houses instead and basically threaten them and say, either we trick you and destroy your property or you give us candy. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other origin of trick-or-treating. And I've also heard, um, a more ancient origin tying back to the original festival of Samhain where they would uh, lay out fruit and sweets yeah. to try and ward off and appease and kind of like propitiate um, the evil spirits. And a lot of times if you didn't do that, you get a trick, you get a curse they yeah. put on you if you didn't try to appease them with fruit. And kind yeah. Of give, yeah, yeah. And so there's this belief that Halloween is um, a night of mystical power, of magical power, and there's a, thin a thinning of the veil between natural and spirit world, and the dead, the spirits of the dead and ghosts and so forth, come up and interact with us in the natural world, and that is what the pagans in Ireland started practicing and celebrating. They brought it over here, and we're, you know, we're like, well, that looks good. It looks, sure, it's great. <laughs> and we started practicing it. Um, but, you know, when, I'm th when we think of how this relates to scripture, um, Paul gives us two different categories in which to understand uh, pagan celebratory events or festivals. One would be in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 8. And the first category is where we are partaking of the byproduct of something that occurred that was pagan. So we're not participants ourselves in the pagan activity, but there was a byproduct that came from that that is, you know, maybe neither good nor bad. The example Paul gives is, um, you know, meat that was part of some kind of like ritual unto one of the gods of the Greco-Roman world that meat would then be sold in the marketplace after. And Paul is saying, if you're going through the marketplace, don't walk by and ask them if it was offered to gods or not, because, you know, it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And so he says like, you know, only, he says, uh, don't, if, if eating that kind of meat causes your brother to stumble though, then he won't eat that kind of meat. Mm -hmm. But he's saying for his own walk with the Lord, he's like, you know, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, so it doesn't matter if I'm eating meat that was used in some kind of ceremony and then sold in the marketplace later. But the category that I would say things like yoga and Halloween fall into is a separate category where it's direct participation in the event mm -hmm. or the activity itself which he talks about two chapters later in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where he says, so you had, um, I talked about this a little bit in uh, the talk on Sunday morning, where you would have uh, altars that were set up to the Greco-Roman gods, Dionysus or whatever, um, and then you would have food, fruits and meats that were offered unto the deity, like on the altar, and the church in Corinth members of the Corinthian church would enter into these pagan temples and sit around the altar and eat the fruit that had been offered unto the idol. And Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 10, he, he makes a few. His first is that when we're participating in communion, um, like we're participating in the blood and body of the Lord, mm -hmm. there's something, it, it's an act of worship. When we're eating that which is involved in an act of worship, we're actually worshiping the one to whom it's being owed to. Does that make sense? So he, he then says that in the Old Testament, when priests would offer sacrifices in the, the Le Levitical system, sorry, it's a hard word for me to say, <laughs> the Levitical system, um, that they would then eat the meats from the animals who had been killed. 
and that eating of the meats was meant to be part of the worship and the sacrifice unto Yahweh. It was part of devotion to the being who was on the other, the receiving end of this sacrifice and this altar. And so Paul was saying, if you're participating in something that is meant to go toward another deity or another spirit, that for one, you're participating with demons because what pagans offer unto idols, they offer unto demons. So in this case, it would be when you're trying to you know, invite these spirits into your house through um, having fruit outside your house. We don't do that one so much more now. But when we are dressing up as other spirits to try and like deflect from them, or when we are using jack-o'-lanterns. Jack-o'-lanterns, there is one spirit in particular. There's different origin thoughts of how this originated, but there's one guy whose name was Stingy Jack. Hmm. And Stingy Jack, um, he was too bad to get into heaven, like we all are, amen. But he, he also bothered the devil so much that the devil wouldn't let him into hell. So he was kind of just banished to roam around the natural world, like in the spirit realm. And he was like a bad guy. And so you would put jack-o'-lanterns and fire in them to kind of scare off and ward off uh, Stingy Jack. And so what you're essentially trying to do is interact with other spirits. Mm. It's a form of spiritism. You're trying to interact with, engage, and participate in rituals and ceremonies that are meant to um, engage with these, the spirits of the dead, which uh, the spirits of the dead don't do that kind of thing. These would be demons uh, categorically. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, the parable of, is it Lazarus? Um, who was the one who died, went to hell, and he said oh, he wants to come back the, over? The, and he's like, those who've died, they don't come yeah, back over. Yeah. You know, once you're there, you're there. And so Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 10 is that when you're doing things, whatever pagans are offering unto other spirits or deities, they're offering unto demons. And it's causing you to participate with demonic powers. Um, but that wasn't actually Paul's main argument. Um, it wasn't that they per were participating with demons. It wasn't that he was warning them that their actions had crossed a point further than they realized, though both of those things were contained in that message. His primary concern was provoking Yahweh to jealousy. Oh, yeah. Are we stronger than him? Are we going to provoke the Lord to jealousy? That's First Corinthians 10.22. Uh, and the reason why he was primarily concerned with the jealousy of Yahweh is because every single time in the Torah, in the uh, Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, that God's jealousy is meant to has to do, or is spoken about, it has to do with idolatry or the images of idolatry. And some of the most graphic and fearsome displays of God's wrath in the Old Testament have to do with God being provoked to jealousy over the love and devotion of his people. And, um, you know, the picture we're painted in uh, the Bible of God is one of a father hmm. and one of a bridegroom and a husband, hmm. right? And so he has this loving, righteous jealousy over our affection, our yeah. devotion. And when we start giving that to other idols, other images, um, we're giving it to the demons behind the idols and images, and it's provoking the Lord to jealousy because we're essentially cheating on him with the most wicked forces you can imagine. Yeah. And it provokes him to jealousy and cut off people from his covenant promises and his blessings. So Paul's argument is if we are doing this, you know, just remember what happened in last time in the Old Testament when people tried to worship other gods and <laughs> God would wipe his people out or split the earth in half, right, with the, the golden calf and a bunch of, like, it was pretty graphic what happened in the Old Testament. And um, in Ezekiel chapter eight, uh, idols are actually called images of jealousy. They're called images of jealousy that provoke to jealousy. And it was God's jealousy of his people, the love of his people that prompted him to issue a command, the second commandment, you shall not make any graven image um, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Amen. Right? And so when we're doing things that are actively participating with powers and forces of darkness, Paul's primary concerns were, for one, you're inviting participation with demons um, and because there's only the heavenly host that are serving Yahweh, and every other spirit being other than that is automatically by default on the other side of the Amen. fence. Amen. And then his second argument, which was his primary one, which is that we're provoking the Lord to jealousy when we are participating, even if we don't have malicious intent. So it's not like the, these were born-again Christians. 
right? And Paul was saying, even though you don't have malicious intent, you're not waking up one day and saying, I'm going to go worship, you know, Epaphrodites today, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm going to go provoke the Lord to jealousy and be a wicked person. Mm-hmm. They're like, no, you know, you're just a pagan temple, and sure, you know, you know, I got liberty, you know, I got liberty in Christ. <laughs> I can go in there, and I, and I can go eat not off legal. the altars of other pagan deities and so forth and not pay a price. And he's like, well, you can, you can do that. You're able to, but well, there's a lawful. price to pay. And the price is oppression and provoking God to jealousy, which I don't think we're going to be cut off from his covenant now. Um, He'll never leave us nor forsake us nor turn his heart away from us or his back against us. Um, But at the very least, um, will it cause us to experience fatherly displeasure and grieve the spirit in our lives and maybe thwart us off the path of the will of God? Um, If this is something that's kind of like becoming normal in our lives. Um, so I think that we would, we'd have to look at 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and ask the question, when we're talking about active participation in an active spiritism, does this, is this best categorized as meat offered unto idols or into active participation with, um, you know, a pagan ritual, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Okay. Like you said, you, even with that ignorance, you knew, you kind of felt it before you even knew it that you shouldn't participate in Halloween, right? And you kind of were feeling that before you were saying, hey, we have to do it, right? I mean, isn't that kind of what you said in the beginning? Yeah. 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 I, could, so you, I could sense the Spirit was yeah. being grieved with that. And that's why uh, the Holy Spirit lead us in all truth. So when you don't know, a lot of times you have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And I would say this too. Um, there's, a, there's more than enough commandments when you look at, I want to say Ephesians 5.11, like have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but that's instead cool. expose them. So we'd have to ask the question, does this qualify as a fruit of darkness? Yeah. You know, does dressing up in the cost, costumes Which of dead is. people or any costumes to try and disguise myself from spirits and ghosts that are wandering the street at night. Is this a, a work of darkness that I'm participating in this historically pagan, um, you know, uh, ceremony is what it was. And there's other elements too that used to be part of uh, Samhain, such as animal sacrifice mm-hmm. to the gods of weather that would happen during the festi- uh, festival of Halloween because they wanted to uh, propitiate these gods so that way they would survive the winter. Because you know, when you're living off the land, basically everything you do requires that the land cooperate with you. And so they would offer animals unto their gods on this night to propitiate them and to satisfy them and appease them so that they would bless them for the winter months. Yeah. And you know, we would have to ask the question, is this an unfruitful work of darkness for me to be participating in this, even if I, in my mind, I'm not consciously engaging in spiritism. Yeah. Um, another one would be First, first Thessalonians 5, 22, have nothing to do, uh, or sorry, abstain from every form of evil. Yeah. Um, is this a form of evil? Yeah. Um, you know, setting no unclean thing before our eyes. Mm. This, this participating qualify as an unclean thing set before my eyes. Uh, there's a lot of verses talking yeah. about this, so um, yeah, I think it should make us think, and I do think that we don't have a choice but to you know uh, qualify this and classify this as a participation of a, of a pagan ritual and event in First Corinthians yeah. chapter ten. I like what you said the dichotomy. How like Jesus said in John ten ten, I've come that you have might have life and life more abundantly, life to the fullest. But Satan, the opposite, like you said, is only two real, two spiritual realms. But Satan comes to steal, to kill and destroy. So why would you want body parts around? You know, we shouldn't celebrate death, and that's pretty much so. That's the total opposite of what God's about: light, life, which everything else, darkness everything dying, you know, October. So right. it's kind of just, it's totally opposite of what God celebrates and yeah. what God is. And Satanists use this day too to do rituals unto the devil and to demons and so yeah. forth because they do believe that there's a special kind yeah. of like thin, demonic please. anointing on this day um, for magical purposes. Uh, witches will invite spirits into their home. They'll draw, uh, use chalk and draw out um, like circles on the ground and then draw like windows or doors in there to represent allowing the, demon, uh, the spirits to come up and to, to hang out with them. They'll set up altars in their home or uh, plates with food on them to invite the spirits of their deceased ancestors and friends into their house and allow them to come eat with them. Or they'll open their window and light a candle out uh, on the windowsill to invite the spirits of their deceased yeah. ancestors into their house. So, um, you know, Anton LaVey has said, I'm thankful that, uh, you know, Christian parents allow their children to worship the devil at least one day a year in reference to Halloween. And he was the uh, founding father of the Church of Satan and the author of the Satanic Bible. 
Um, so there's a rich history when it comes to this holiday, when it comes to paganism, and when it comes to uh, witchcraft, Wicca, warlocks, and so forth. And so I think another good passage for this would be 2 Corinthians chapter 6, um, where it says, what fellowship 14. has, yeah, starting in verse 14, what fellowship has light with darkness, what accord has Christ with Belial, uh, come ye separate from the world, touch no unclean thing, and then I will receive you. Amen. So come ye separate from the world, that would be the first part, which he, what, he, what he's trying to communicate there is we need to look distinct from the pagan nations. That's why God was so obsessed in the Old Testament with like, you know, with how you dress and the length of your beard and not having markings on your skin and all this stuff because he wanted a people set apart and distinct from himself and people would seem like there's something different about them, right? I want my people to be devoted to myself. These other nations are worshiping foreign gods and demon gods and I want a people that looks different, talks different um, and lives different. So come ye separate from the ways of the pagan nations and the ways of the pagan nations for 2,000 years have been Samhain. Um, and then he says, and touch no unclean thing. And so that's mm. another question. Does this qualify as an unclean thing or a clean thing in the eyes of God? Yep. And Jude tells us to hate even the garment stained mm. with the flesh. Yep. Mm. Exactly. Right? So, I mean, we could ask the question, you know, does this fit into that category as well? Like, are we hating something that's even remotely evil? Yeah. You know? I was, I was telling on the podcast today, Stephen, that I was a Baptist, saved Baptist, and I didn't believe in the demonic. I mean, I knew Satan's real, but I didn't believe you could have demonic oppression as a Christian. And I remember I, would just, I was seeing demonic faces and stuff, and I, was, and I was saying, God, why is this? I'm a Christian. What's going on? And God spoke to me watching uh, horror movies. That, that was kind of opening the door. Yep. And we, don't, we think, I mean, how many people watch horror movies and Christians? Mm -hmm. But that opens the door because we're kind of celebrating. And I just thought, oh, it's funny. It's not real. It's, you know, I mean, I'm just, I just like the adrenaline rush of getting scared. But the Lord said, no, that really is. And they say, I mean, Chuck Smith's movie of a Hollow Trick or Treat, saying that they actually do hire witches and warlocks to kind of make it real. So it is getting, I mean, when I was a little kid, I'm 58. A lot of the horror movies were like little spiders on strings, and it was just, it was kind of laughable, but now it's, you know, you, you know, it's pretty realistic, all the demonic stuff, and a lot of the spells, Harry Potter, a lot of it they're saying is real, uh, real spells, Wiccan spells, so you need to flee it. Yeah. Same way, any questions? Are you ready to go for a question? You want to? Yeah. You can come up. Come on up. Or you want to go back to, go yeah, back, Dave, run. run. Run like the wind, David. Um, growing up, how did your parents kind of navigate teaching you about this, like, Halloween as, like, did they teach it as, like, oh, it's bad? Or did they teach it as, like, a, oh, this is a holiday, probably shouldn't celebrate it? And did you see, like, oh, this isn't a big deal, just kids dressing up in costumes? And how old were you when you realized, like, oh, there's actually a deeper meaning behind it? So, Right. Well, it comes down to, I like a point Morgan made last uh, Q&A, where if you're living a righteous life and your kids see that and you're like being real, they kind of just, they'll, they'll respect you more when you make decisions that might inconvenience them. They're like, well, I trust that, you know, they know God and I can see that they know God. And so if they say no, I trust it's because God says no. Mm. And so my parents for a few years, I think they were trying to find out um, like the will of the Lord on it. And so I went out as like a road hockey goalie one year. I'm like wearing <laughs> goalie gear going door to door. Um, another year, I went as Batman. The year after, I went as Batman, the same costume. And the third year, I went as Batman in the same costume, and it did not fit me. And there's this, there's this picture of me, and I'm like nine years old, and I'm wearing a Batman costume, doesn't fit, and I'm crying. And my brother has this brand new Zorro costume, and he looks so happy. But um, I think we stopped when I was maybe like 11 or 12. I think that's when my parents started to um, be exposed more to the like, Christian arguments against it. And I don't remember ever resisting them for it or making a peep about it. My parents would just you know, buy us some snacks and we'd have a movie night inside. We'd shut off the lights um, in our house so people would you know, know not to come ring the doorbell kind of thing. And we just kind of opted out. We just chose not to celebrate it. And I didn't, I didn't have any problem with that as long as they bought me candy. 
<laughs> and I didn't go to school the next day as the only kid without candy and everyone has like Smarties and stuff. And <laughs> that would have probably caused me to like hate them <laughs> um, and like resent God and be like, God's no fun. But um, they would buy a bunch of candy and we'd just watch a movie together as a family, you know, in the dark because we didn't want people to ring the doorbell. And um, I respected them for it. They didn't really explain much to me, but... I respected my parents' walk in the, in the Lord so much that I didn't need an explanation. Amen. It was just mom says no, yeah. dad says no. I know they walk with God. Um, maybe some kids would even need an explanation at that point, mm -hmm. in which case maybe it's good to dig into the history of Halloween a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dave, I think someone's back there. Oh, I guess my question is, because I'm kind of stuck with uh, the kids wanting to go to a haunted house on Halloween. Mm. Um, you know, the big event, uh, Buckaloo Farms, the corn in the maze, yep. you know, and I know all them that are running it. And uh, what about Christians who say we can go anywhere, we can preach the gospel when we go there, you know, We'd wear the t-shirt and hand out tracks or I, I kind of thought of an analogy. Like I used to be a really big biker and um, riding Harleys around and I would ride with the bikers for Christ and, and we would go to the Hells Angels events. We'd go to every event, you know, and we're ministering there. So I don't know if that correlates or not, but yeah. Kids want to go to the haunted corn maze. Mm -hmm. How do I handle that? Yep. If the kids want to go to evangelize yeah. and not participate yeah. in the haunted corn maze, um, because I think that there are, you know, spirits of death and fear mm -hmm. in these haunted homes, or you know, even makeshift haunted homes. Um, and I've been to one uh, after I got saved. It was my first year, and I don't know what I was doing, man, <laughs> but. I went, and there was this maze, which is, and people come out with, like, chainsaws and start chasing you, and it's terrifying. And I just, I literally remember just uh, being on this, like, r like this kind of, like, slow-moving roller coaster on a trolley track, and having these scary things jump out, and people dressed up, like, popping out from every corner. I remember just closing my eyes and thinking, thank God Jesus exists. <laughs> thank God Jesus is real. Amen. Because the amount of terror that was trying to be cultivated in that environment, it was just so of the enemy. And it was just feeding that energy. Amen. And um, yeah, I repented of participating in that after I experienced it. Yeah. Um, and, but when it, so I wouldn't participate in that and I wouldn't allow my children to either. But when it comes to like going there to evangelize, I would say, yeah, go there and evangelize as long as you're being the influencer and not the influenced. Amen. Right? So, like, I believe we should be bringing Jesus everywhere we go as long as we're the one, you know, who sets the bar and sets the standard, mm -hmm. and that standard is not being compromised. Um, so, if, we're, if we want to go to the bar to evangelize, as long as it's not a stumbling block for us and, you know, we're not like a recovering alcoholic who's weak to that, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, as long as Jesus is invited and Jesus is dominant, Amen. right? Amen. Um, but we're to go into the highways and byways. Mm -hmm. Like we, we need we can't be scared to go into psychic fairs and to go into new age events thinking we're gonna get something on us. Mm -hmm. If we do that, like God's given us a call to preach the gospel to every nation, which includes pagan nations. Mm -hmm. Um so we should be going and doing that. As long as we know we're strong enough in the Lord and prayed up enough that we're not gonna be ensnared by some of the same sins mm -hmm. that we're seeing around us. Some Christians will be saved 10 minutes and like, oh man, I'm going to go hang out with my buddies and they're going to be smoking bongs and drinking beer and I'm going to go tell them about how awesome Jesus is. And then they start smoking weird and drinking beers with them. And it's like, that's not wisdom. Mm -hmm. So like be prayed up, use, use wisdom and know your limits because none of us are above sin, none of us are above temptation or above falling. So to just make sure that we're being realistic with ourselves yeah. and um, we're not using it as an excuse evangelism. Mm -hmm. as an excuse to massage this old fantasy we have with this kind of sin, you know? I often wonder, what is participation in Halloween, you know? I, I often think about that, 
yeah, obviously putting a really scary costume on and really participating. But what about a little kid wants to dress up like a ladybug and... I really don't like uh, trick-or-treating. I completely agree, and I'm glad that I'm doing a really good job of getting my kids off of that, not only because it's, uh, we shouldn't be doing it, but it's also just stupid, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Is there any, anything to be said about what exactly is participating? Is there a way to, sl to slightly participate but not really participate? I don't know. I like, yeah, harvest festivals. <laughs> we have a harvest festival <laughs> that churches have. But what do you, I'll let you uh, crush the little girl's spirit who wants to be a ladybug. <laughs> what, no, what do you no. think, Craig? Do you like <laughs> what we always tell the kids is that, like, you can get the costumes, you can do that, because every Wednesday night, like, what we have right now, the kids, we have different themes, and they dress up, they wear, like, different costumes and stuff, and they get to have those days, but we explain to them, like, that day is set apart where other children, their age and stuff, we don't really say this to them but if they're older are being sacrificed like they're being stuff so we're praying and interceding so we're not getting all like it's not all about us during that day it's it's being able to intercede and pray for these kids who are being taken who are being um, molested raped killed and so we just teach them that like hey all the other days of the year you can dress up like you can wear those costumes yeah. and then the harvest festival just like Stephen was saying what we have is like they still get probably more kids than more candy than most kids get and like mm -hmm. you'll be able to come to school and show that you have, you have more to go candy. door to door I, door I remember growing up and I had more candy than all the other kids at the harvest festival and so you can still have fun and the kids don't have to be like the losers because they're not the weird Christian kids but yet still teach your kids to be able to like see the adults like at harvest festivals praying and worshiping and praising Jesus and not afraid like we hand out glow sticks and stuff like we're teaching them like it's about the light of Jesus it's not mm. about the darkness and um the I think it second Timothy 1 7 he's not given us a spirit of fear mm. so children really at that young age they shouldn't be exposed to that stuff like even if they're going around because maybe they're dressing up fine but they see other things mm. like in it that fear is not supposed to be put in them that way so I don't know if that answers the question, but the Harvest Festival, right here, David. And I think, too, you know, like we were saying about participants, you know, Paul says all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. And we need to be really pray. Like you said, it's not a, we were talking about that, how we always want black and white, but some things you have to be sensitive to spirit. But I would say, like you were saying, if you go through the maze, right, if you dress up like a vampire, you kind of are subtly welcoming that. But if you go there with the intent to stand outside the corn maze, whatever it's called, and witness, that's totally different, right? And it's like, and we have to be, you know, not unaware of Satan's schemes, as you were talking about when we were studying, uh, what was it? What was it? I don't remember. It was. But, so yeah, but, but, but uh, we need to be on, realize that he's always trying to trick us. He's always trying to seduce us. And we have to be as shrewd as Jesus said, as servants yet, as innocent or as gentle as doves, right? We don't want to be afraid, but we need to be shrewd. We need to be wise. We need to be prayed up and really say, am I wanting to do the maze because I dig the maze? Or am I wanting to be a witness to get people out of the maze of life without God? So there it is. Preach it. Okay. So uh, I got Hispanic and Catholic and so for us a huge celebration was Dia de los Muertos yeah, which pretty much is the Hispanic celebration of death and uh, pretty much a Halloween for them. How would you say for somebody who grew up in a culture like that who grew up celebrating that with their family um, and they have to go back into that constantly after being saved um, you know how, how would you say would be the best way not only to minister to that person but also how to help them understand that their culture is no longer, you know, that it, it you know. Yeah, I, is it called the Day of the Dead? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I would, I would pocket some of the verses that we listed earlier and kind of have them on file. Things like flee from every appearance of evil, you know, what fellowship has light with darkness, touch no unclean thing, um, you know, have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always find it helpful to have maybe two or three key Bible passages mm -hmm. 
before I try to minister to anybody about any topic, you know, even just Googling it and then searching through a list of verses that come up and being like, which ones are the most relevant to the conversation I'm about to have? And just spending a couple minutes memorizing two or three Bible verses and being able to pull them out at an opportune time, that goes a long way. Um, And was your question more about how do you personally want to prepare entering, enter back into that, like for your own protection, or is it more evangelistic that you're asking? Well, I'm just wondering because people, I know a lot of times with family and roots, there's a lot of soul ties, there's a lot of things that they deal with, especially with being with their family. So somebody, let's say they grew up in that household, they come back after being saved, you know, with their parents, and they do the normal traditions, you know, they're stuck in this tradition, so they go back and they're like, well, it's my family. You know, I got to do X, Y, and Z. I got to do A, B, C. Yeah. You know, how, what do you explain to them that, you know, how do you, how do you, because you know, it's a hard thing okay. for people. In it is a hard and thing, and it's supposed to be a hard thing, and I don't think there is a way to make it not a hard thing. Um, Jesus says, do not think I've come to bring peace on the earth. Do you know this verse? I haven't come to bring peace, but division. For because of me, a man will be set against those in his own household. Man. You know, father against his daughter and daughter against uh, her mother and so forth. So, and he says, and because of me, you'll be hated. You'll be hated by every nation for my name's sake, right? And um, you know, being persecuted for the sake of righteousness is one of the most certain promises in all of Scripture. Um, all of the promises in Scripture that have to do with suffering in the New Testament have to do with suffering on behalf of the name of Christ and devotion to the gospel. So it's going to cause separation and division, but it's intended to, right? God has, you know, plucked you out of the world and wants you to be distinct and set apart as a child of God and not a child of the world, you know? And so he's given you a new identity and a new place. Um, And you don't fit into the world around you anymore. You're not supposed to. And there is no bridging those two worlds. Um because you're walking with the Lord now, and he's not of this world, yeah. right? So the question is, you know, yeah, you can be kind to them and loving to them as you're supposed to. You know, Jesus says, be gentle as doves and uh, wise as serpents. You want to be calculative. You don't want to be ab- unnecessarily abrasive if you don't have to be, or unnecessarily combative if you don't have to be. If they start, like, tweaking out or something over the fact <laughs> that, you know, you're not participating in these, you know, rituals or ceremonies with them or whatever, and you're you know, opting out, like give yourself permission to opt out if something grieves your conscience, right? If there's anything you're doing that grieves your conscience, the Paul says whatever doesn't issue from faith is a sin, mm-hmm. right? So if they're doing something weird or whatever and want you to wear something weird um, and it doesn't concord with your moral compass you're, now that you're in the Lord, you know, to act on that is to participate in, in something sinful for you. Right? If it doesn't issue from a clean conscience and faith, it, it's a sin. So, um, yeah, I would say expect division and persecution. Um, the Lord promises that. Be kind and loving in the midst of that. And uh, pray for them. Um, and, yeah, I would, I would also say pray for your own protection, too, before you go into Like, Lord, protect me. You know, keep my heart uh, away from temptation. You know, deliver me from evil and, you know, give me guidance and protection tonight and so forth. Yeah. And, and Satan, too, has tried to hide, you know, like you were saying, Saulween, that that was on 31st, but then All Saints Day, right? The Catholic Church tried to sanitize it and make it the, you know, uh, honoring martyred saints and also the Day of the Dead. So they're trying to make a satanic holiday. If you even go to, if you even go to HistoryChannel.com, they'll say Saulween. They'll say it started. But you even ask some pastors, they'll say, No, Halloween's a holy holiday. You're like, no, no, the origin is unholy, but the church has tried to sanitize it. But how do you sanitize death and body parts? And, you know, you kind of need to just have, an, like, like, like Mariah said, we do, we, we try not to mimic the world in the sense of having everything Halloween y, but, you know, hey, kids dig candy. So we figure, hey, we can, we can go there, but have it more celebrating the light, praying and stuff. So, just know that whole day of the day. Because they make it honorable. Hey, you're honoring your dead ancestors, right? You're, you're being thankful. So it sounds so noble, but really behind it is honoring death, which is only one who loves death is Satan. He loves to steal, kill, and destroy. He loves death. We don't. Christ doesn't. Do, or we'll do three or four more questions. So. 
Uh, my name is Ophir, so my first night here, I didn't get a chance to see your other talks, but uh, I'm sure they're awesome. Anyways, so <laughs> blood. Zombies, werewolves, vampires, it's all over Halloween. People use it for their decorations, it's all over the place. And, well, Jesus talks about drinking of the wine. It's my blood, so consumption. And then throughout all of Old Testament, there's blood all over the place, yeah. just with sacrificial. You know, I've never killed an animal, and of course, you know, that's going to freak me out if that ever comes, <laughs> like, in my life. But blood is pretty intense. Why is that? Why is God captivated by the use of blood, and so is Satan? That's a good question. The answer would be in Leviticus chapter 17. Um, he explains why, he ex Yahweh explains why he accepts and receives um, the offering of animal blood as an atonement for sin, right? So in Ezekiel, it tells us the soul who sins shall die. And Romans tells us that the wages of sin is death. So death is the penalty um, in the eyes of God that is owed to us because of our sin. So because he's so holy and sin is so vile and heinous to him, he requires that life be given as a payment for sin, Right? So we deserve death. We deserve capital punishment in the eyes of God. And so he allowed an animal to represent us and die in our place. Right? And the priest would come and lay hands on the animal, which represented like the sins of the world being laid upon that animal, and then the, uh, or the sins of the people. And then um, the animal would be sacrificed. And he says that the life of the animal is in the blood. Mm -hmm. right? And so there, we could call it even uh, life force, if you will. Sounds a little weird. But that's, little, that's what he's saying. There's like, the, like life, what's, what makes us alive is in our blood. Yeah. And so Yahweh would allow that to atone for sin because sin is worthy of death as a payment. And the reason why Satan is obsessed with it is for that same reason. Because yeah, the life of the animal or the life of anybody is in the blood. And so in the Satanic Bible, I bought it like uh, uh, two weeks after I got saved. And I was reading through it to look for parallels between that and New Ageism. And I came across some passages that had to deal with um, using blood in satanic ritual. And the reason why Anton LaVey said that they liked using it was he, he described it as bio, um, bioelectric energy that is in the, the blood and that it's very powerful for using in, in spell casting or in devotion to demons. And um, what he's basically describing is the life of Leviticus 17, right? So there's something powerful to blood. Um, because in it is life. And so Satan wants that life energy devoted to him as empowerment. Yahweh doesn't need it. He's already all-powerful, but he requires the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins, like it says in Hebrews. Um, so Jesus came to die for our sins uh, and be that, that blood offering, that blood sacrifice, uh, to offer up his body and his blood, Ephesians 5, 2, as a fragrant offering unto Yahweh. But you know, Satan wants that preciousness, the innocence of the blood, um, and the, as LaVey says, the bioelectric energy in the blood, and he wants to use that to empower, uh, to empower demons, to energize demons. And so that's why they're obsessed with blood. And actually, Anton LaVey drew from the work of Aleister Crowley, mm -hmm. and Aleister Crowley said that using the blood of a, a young male, uh, preferably around 12 years old, is the best for witchcraft magic. Um, so they're looking for innocence in the blood and blood for the purpose of like doing black magic with it because it energizes the demon so much because of the life that's in it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's good. And just and Satan yeah. likes to mimic God. I mean, pretty much he's not yeah. an original. Thinker. Five minutes left. So. <laughs> So That's quick. Okay. That way a little bit. Okay. So my question is, is a lot of the times people say like Christmas and Easter also have pagan roots. So like, what's the difference with Halloween? Like, well, should we also not celebrate Christmas and Easter? Like, because, and it's like, or they'll also say like, well, Halloween, it's like only bad if you make it bad. Like we can make, we can like bring the good out of it or it's like, or they're like, they just kind of deny the existence of like the demonic in it. So just, especially Christians, I've noticed a lot of the times, like even there are some local churches who have their stuff out for like their Halloween festivals and. Yep. So just what do you have to say about that? Um, I haven't researched Christmas or Easter enough to tell you like the origins of them and give a comprehensive answer. But my understanding is that Easter and Christmas, which do have roots in certain pagan holidays, mm -hmm. um, that they were meant to, to celebrate life and fertility, mm -hmm. not to propitiate evil spirits. Mm -hmm. 
and glorify death. Yep. So I would think that that's just a, a category distinction I'd like to make first and foremost. Um, I don't know enough about Christmas, but I do know that it was also one of those things, I think, where um, December 21st, 25th meant a lot to pagans. And I think the early church fathers were like, you know what, let's make this day mean mm-hmm. something to Jesus. So we're going to start celebrating his birth on this day. Even though the earliest records we have from the early church cite January, and then some cite uh, September, month of September and fall, um, there's varying traditions on that, but it seems like the early church was like, you know what, we're going to have the 25th as a day where we celebrate Jesus, because pagans are celebrating all their gods on this day. We want to celebrate the Lord on this day. Um, When it comes to, I, I just wouldn't see, I just don't see a parallel because of um, you have one that is meant to celebrate Jesus, the other that's not meant to celebrate anything. It's meant to blend you in with evil spirits roaming mm-hmm. the streets. Yep. You know, So I think it's just a category distinction. But mm-hmm. I wish I could give more information on Easter mm-hmm. and Christmas, but unfortunately I can't. Well, one, one, like one person, like Tammuz, the worshiping the tree, and I always say, you know, we have a Christmas tree, but... I've never worshipped my Christmas tree, so I think you know as long as you don't as long as you don't worship your Christmas tree, I say it's all right. And we always make the distinction that Easter is an Estar, it isn't the God of Fertility you're worshiping Jesus. And so that's redeemable, I believe, but how do you make death good? Now they tried honoring the dead, but we're not I mean, you know, I mean we can think about our relatives, but really it's once for a man to die in the judgment, it's over. We don't get to pray him in. Yeah. We don't get to do so we can think about him, but really we can do that any day. We don't need a special and also day. On that day, just little statistics like I think um, the LA police department said 26 to 30 percent of crime is like it's goes up like that day there's a lot of bad stuff that's happening so if we're just like let's have fun and throw your kids out in the streets like that's just not wise like so we need to make sure that we're not just getting caught up in that but because it's really a facade so in during it like during that time it's just the same thing with abortion like we need to speak up and stand up for those who can't fight for themselves there's children literally being sacrificed and murdered on that day of halloween Mm. and if we're just having fun and not praying and interceding like it says in proverbs 31 8 to defend those who can't defend themselves so this is why we do what we do and so i that's just my prayer with what everyone whatever question you have or just concern to realize that there are children, you know, being sacrificed. There are breeders of women, you know, being raped and this stuff going on. So we can't just, like, let's just have fun and make it about us. We can't live a comfortable life as American Christians. We need to stand up and defend those who can't fight for themselves. So, mm-hmm. last question. Um, well, I completely agree with everything, I think. Um, and it's kind of a, my, my brother and his kids, um, they were celebrating in their own way, you know, the little kid costumes and stuff like that. And before I was saved, I actually, like, did their face paintings and stuff like that, but I've never actually participated myself. And my my question, so I'm in agreement, but my question kind of connects back to hers about Christmas, because you had mentioned that jack-o'-lanterns, um, this practice, which I don't think that people's intent, like you mentioned before, it really connects back to the, um, pagan practice itself, but you mentioned how um, somehow it might still have a connection to the spiritual realm, um, if I understood you correctly. So my question about Christmas, um, I haven't done so much research myself, but as far as uh, the tradition of the tree and things like that, I know it has to do with like um, something with the solstice. It's more, the tradition of the tree is more related to uh, pagans' um, not necessarily worshiping the tree, but worshiping the elements, um, and uh, I think light returning or something like that. Um, so my question was, if the practice of the jack-o'-lantern, um, with no intent to actually have any spiritual reaction, could still possibly um, result in that, is it would you say that it might also be possible for some sort of spiritual interaction um, with practices like trees and um, I don't know what that one's called that you hang above your head, but stuff like that, yeah, mistletoe, but like stuff like that, where that specifically goes back to pagan roots. Um, I would say uh, that maybe 
we, we can still, I think it's awesome that we, we praise Jesus on that day. That's the only day that, that the world actually recognizes the Lord as well, and I think that's awesome. Um, but as far as Christians having those things in their homes, is that similar to also using the jack-o'-lantern and maybe wearing a costume, even if it's not a costume that glorifies death? Good question. Yeah, I would, I would uh, again, make a category distinction between well, first of all, a pumpkin and a jack-o'-lantern. So um, a pumpkin is God's creation, and, you know, it's part of what he called good in the book of Genesis, right? So a tree is also part of God's creation, and mistletoe, he called it good. Um, crystals as well, like people ask me, like, yeah, crystals, they're used in, you know, pagan, uh, you know, healing arts and so forth, like Reiki, you know, um, are crystals bad? Are crystals evil? It's like, no, God created crystals. They're part of his creation. Um, if you start using them for metaphysical purposes, now all of a sudden they're a tool of idolatry and a tool of sorcery, and now you've transgressed the commandment. But when it comes to putting up, you know, having a pumpkin on my step during a, uh, like a festive time of year, or a tree in my house. So there would be a difference. I, like, I want to I understand and research the origin of a Christmas tree. I'm not sure. But there would be a difference between positioning the tree in, in such a way and arranging everything in such a way where it has been historically in, intended to um, owe itself to some kind of pagan deity or spirit in that set and setting versus... You know, pagans used to use the tree as a symbol of fertility during the winter season. In which case, I don't care what, what they thought about it, you know. If there is a way that they set it up as some kind of an altar to some deity, I don't want to recreate the set and setting of that altar. But, you know, they don't have a monopoly on these plants. <laughs> you know, the, the devil doesn't have a monopoly on these plants. So, I wouldn't have a problem with putting a Christmas tree in my house unless I knew that the Christmas tree, um, when set up a very specific way, which to my knowledge, I'm, I mean, I'm agnostic because I need to do re more research on this, but unless it was meant to be set up in a very specific way such that it was an altar to some kind of principality or demon such that it would fall under the first Corinthians 10, 20 to 22 category. But if pagans want to say, well, you know, fire represents you know, I don't know, this to me or that to me during this season, and then they light fires in their house to represent that. I mean, like, they don't own fire. They don't own wind or water or the seasons. Um, so, yeah, I guess to summarize that whole answer, I would say there's a difference between a jack-o'-lantern and a pumpkin, and discerning the difference between those two would probably be sufficient for that answer, I think. Okay. Where did David go? Oh, do you have... One more question. More question. I think there was back there. Wincy, you got one? Do you have one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. All right. I'm going to look on the YouTube live. We're going to do one of their questions because I feel bad for not answering. Um, okay. So this... Okay. It says, <laughs> I have a question. In my area, most people... Um, give out corn cakes instead of candies to people, trick-or-treaters for Halloween. Is it possible to give out um, types of food besides candies? Also, like, the theme question is, can they give out tracks during that time? Can they give out, like, Christian things and make it um, different? Because, like, if they're not going to harvest festivals, you know, and they're just, like, staying at their house. Because we've done that before. We just uh, turn Locked our lights out. off, but we've had our house egged and, like, <laughs> pumpkins thrown at it. So... We've had that happen to us, enough. but anyway, okay. what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with using it as an opportunity to evangelize. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I think kids could be bummed out with corn cakes instead of candy. <laughs> yeah, corn cakes. I mean, I'm, nothing against corn like, cakes. I, 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 I would, I would want to pray into it more, and, and honestly, um, I would want to know what it's like to have children before I give a kind of answer like this, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, you know, if, if the worst thing that I could that I would have to confess before the Lord on Judgment Day is that during trick-or-treating, I handed out a miniature Snickers bar with a gospel tract. Like, I'm doing pretty good, if that's the worst. You know what I mean? Um, but, uh, like, you're using it as a chance to evangelize, yeah. you know? 
Yeah. Um, but handing out like corn cakes and I stuff. Think I don't know that. Like not really, get the corn out of my face. You know. Like that. <laughs> well, I think that I mean it might even defeat your purpose of your gospel tracks if you're handing out such bad food with the gospel. It's <laughs> 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 yeah. like your candy, man. Like a loaf of plain bread and a gospel tract for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You could have some sad kids, yeah. My yeah. kids, I would think you have to add out candy, right? I mean, your kids, yeah, exactly. Okay. Corn cakes, even though they're healthy, or maybe it's cards, just not going to be right. Yeah. Yeah. You, don't, you don't want them to, like, associate, like, <laughs> the cross of Christ with, like, a celery stick or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, just something that's just Peanut horrible. butter celery. Yeah, a radish. Handing out radishes. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Yeah, yeah, garlic cloves. Sure. It's got to have sugar in it or is it right? Yeah. Yeah. Steven, do you have any closing <laughs> thoughts? Um, not really. <laughs> Stephen, have we worn you out this Mic week? Drop. <laughs> Father, I just thank you. We thank you for all that you're doing in our life, Lord. Thank you that your word says it's your truth that sets us free, Lord. And thank you for just the work you did in Stephen's life and so many other lives like ours, just setting us free from darkness, setting us free from the deception of Satan and uh, his, his demons, Lord. We thank you that greater is Christ who is in us than he is in the world. As Stephen said, we don't have to be afraid of the darkness. But we need to be use wisdom. But Lord, help us to be in this world, especially during this Halloween season. Be in this world, but not of this world. Let us, be, let us bring the light. Let us bring the salt of you, the preservative of you, wherever we go. We're always ready to give an account for the hope within us. We're always ready to tell people the good news of Jesus, that you, as we were talking about the blood, that you shed your blood for us, for sinners, once and for all. And all we have to do is receive it. Receive you, Lord Jesus, and all of our sins, past, present, and future, can be forgiven and washed. Give us that. Let us realize that is good news. Let us be bold in love to share the good news of Jesus wherever we go. In Jesus' name, thank you for this night and thank you for bringing Stephen to minister to us in your mighty name. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to just listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much to our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please make sure to check out their website in the description below. You can also support Calvary Conversations by clicking on the support button in the description below. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.